Hello students and welcome to the e-learning program initiated by Shri Gyan Manji Vidyapit for the students of Standard 10 in which we are learning the subject of English students from uh, from previous lecture we started with <coughs> chapter number 10 taken from Beehive. So let's take a quick recap. Beehive chapter number 10, the name of the chapter is uh, Kathmandu and it is written by the famous Indian author Vikram Seth, who is a highly acclaimed uh, novelist of India and he is also uh, quite popular in the foreign countries also because he is one of the bestsellers of English novels written in India. So uh, this particular chapter is taken from one of his book uh, that he explains the journey he has taken from China, China to Tibet, Tibet to Nepal, Nepal to India. So actually this is a travelogue, the memories that we have right after travel that we have done in especially these authors, writers who write fictitious novels, uh, thrillers, actions, they need to uh, have lots of places in their novels and to get an actual view of that place looks like, how the streets look like, how the people are, where are the good places, uh, uh, restaurants, hotels, etc. So they need to have that thing right in front of them so that it makes, them, makes it easier for them to write those novels in a very vivid and colorful way. So in that process, uh, the author has gone to China and he is returning to India via Tibet and Nepal. Now, this travelogue, this particular section that has become our chapter, the extract that has become our chapter has been taken when the uh, author has reached from Tibet to Nepal. In Nepal, he has reached Kathmandu, which is the capital of the, Nep of, uh, the Hindu country, Nepal. Now, Nepal is the only uh, declared Hindu state in the world and uh, very religious uh, people are uh, living out there and they have lots and lots of mandis, temples, etc. One of the m most famous temples of uh, Kathmandu is, uh, is where the author is, uh, has gone for uh, a visit that we have understood in the previous lecture. Uh, now, the author, he vividly describes two temples. One is a Hindu temple and one is a Buddhist monast uh, monastery. So, Pashupatinath is the Hindu temple where at just at the gate we find uh, a signboard which clearly states that only Hindus are allowed over there. So, uh, the foreign tourists who come over there, they get quite a difficult time in entering the mandir because they are not allowed inside as they are not Hindus. And we see lots of commotion over there. Uh, the uh, priests are there, hawkers, devotees, uh, tourists, cows, monkeys, all sorts of people are there, all sorts of um, um, domesticated animals are there, right? And uh, this place is quite noisy, uh, though it is a very sacred place, it's a very holy place, it's considered one of the holiest place in Nepal, the uh, Pashupatinath temple. Pashupatinath is the name of Lord Shiva. So we have lots of shivling over there and these uh, pranky monkeys, they are in lots of number and jumping from here and there. So we have lots of uh, activity going on over there because people are selling flowers, people, hawkers are there uh, trying to sell their wares, lots of tourists are there, Indian tourists from all over the world, people are there. So there's lots of activity going on and uh, when the author enters the uh, temple, a, priest, uh, a princess from the royal family has come to offer her prayers. So she is given a particular path and people bow to her, her as a respect, as a sign of the royalty present over there. And at the main gate, uh, some uh, Hari Rama Hare Krishna uh, mission people, they are clad in saffron and they want to enter the temple. But the uh, the policeman, the guard over there is not convinced because they are white people and he's not convinced that they are Hindu people. So there's a little bit skirmish over there and a little bit wobble fight over there. But we think at the end, because uh, lots of people will gather over there and they'll ask the guard, yes, they are, they are Hindu people. Yes, though they are foreigners, they are white people, but they have embraced Hinduism and they want to enter. So uh, a 
after a little bit of vowel fight, I think uh, they will get entry over there. And uh, then there's a small fight between monkeys that is also shown over here. So this shows the close observation that the author is doing over there. He is being a wizard, but his eyes are everywhere because he needs to remember all things, observe very minutely, uh, whether it is the temple town, uh, whether it is the market outside the Pashupatina temple, uh, the temple itself. Vividly, he has to take each and every minute detail in mind and uh, keep it preserved so that he can use it in, uh, in his upcoming novels. <coughs> then he goes behind the Pashupatinath where Bhagwati river is, uh, Bhagwati river is flowing and it's a, um, it's a, uh, it's a river that comes out from the mountains and a perennial river that means it has uh, water all the 365 days and uh, we see a half submerged small temple over there. There, it, uh, there is a belief, there is a myth that if the temple is wholly out of the water, that means if the water recedes and then the uh, small little temple can be seen. Right now only the top part dome is seen, but if the water recedes and whole of the temple is uh, out of the water level, then the goddess inside it will escape and that is called to be the end of the, uh, of the uh, yug. Yes, Kaliyug and a new yug will start. So that's a just a myth, that's a just a belief over there. Uh, a dead body has been cremated on the banks of uh, the holy river Bhagmati. It is called the Ganges of Nepal, right? Yeah, everywhere in India we have uh, uh, river banks where uh, crematoriums are there and with the last rites of the dead person uh, they are uh, followed. Right, so here also the same thing happens. Then there is lots of activity on the ghats also. Peop uh, people are, uh, women are uh, washing clothes and small little children, they are jumping in the water and having fun, swimming and bathing. And uh, one of the balcony is just over the river. So uh, from the temple below, whatever flower offerings, with the flowers are there, they are thrown up from top of the balcony into the river directly. So all these small, small observation is seen by the author. Next, he goes from the Pashupatinath temple to uh, the Bhautanath stupa. Stupa is the place where the relics of either Buddha or one of his followers are kept over there. Maybe it's a nail, maybe it's a hair, maybe it's a bone. Uh, so in this way, the relics are kept in a wooden box and they are worshipped over there. <coughs> Bodhna Stupa, he finds a contrast over there. Again, he is doing that observation over there, but he finds a stark contrast between uh, what he has seen at Pashupatinath. For example, Pashupatinath, it's quite noisy, it's filled with crowd. Uh, opposite contrast, he sees over there, crowd is there, but they are quite disciplined and there is no noise, absolute silence is there. Uh, we get that sereneness, we get the calmness which we uh, very much want in a temple that is not found in Pashupatinath, but it's found over here at the Bodhnath Tupa because the stillness is there, crowd is there, uh, people are there, they're just moving slowly without making noise. There are small shops outside, vendors are there, but they are not selling their wares by shouting. Yes, people just whoever wants to come over there by, they'll simply have a conversation at a very low sound and they will sell their wares, but they're not shouting at the top of the voice to attract the uh, tourists or the uh, devotees that are come over. So this is a starking contrast between uh, the Pashimatina temple and the uh, Bhautanath Stupa situated over there. Mostly the people over here find are the Tibetan immigrants who ran away after uh, Tibet was annexed by China. They ran away from Tibet and found refuge in uh, Nepal. They, mo many of them, they found refuge in India also, right? So what are they selling? They're selling the um, uh, felt bags, Tibetan prints, uh, silver jewelry, whatever small things they can afford is for a living. So this is a heaven. Heaven means a safe house for or a safe place for quietness. If somebody wants to uh, run away from the hustle bustle of the uh, city uh, in quiet, they can come over here and they will certainly find lots of stillness, quietness, calmness over there. Yes, which will give quite a relief to the uh, mind and body, which is always engaged and finding some peace over there will such an certainly give them a lot of relief. This is what the author finds in his uh, observation. Uh, 
now he explains Kathmandu in the next paragraph. This is where we had reached. So Kathmandu, it's a, it's vivid. Vivid means it's quite colorful. Yes, and uh, you'll find lots of activity bustling over there. But it is mercenary also because Nepal, uh, you know, one of the poorest countries of the world, not so poor, but then the people are certainly poor. And everybody over here works for money. Mercenary means one who works for money. It is usually, mercenary language is usually used for terrorists who work for money. They don't have a religion, they don't uh, have any society where they belong to. Yes, they spread terrorism and they kill innocent people. So the term is actually for the uh, terrorist. But here the term used is mercenary. It is used for the people of the society. They work very hard and they work day and night because a, a, a lot of poverty is there in Nepal and people work for money right from small children, whether they are boys or girls, middle-aged people or old-aged people, they also, men, women, everybody is working hard only and only for money so that they can, they can survive. So that is the word mercenary is used over here. And it is religious also. We see uh, uh, combination of religion over there. Yes, Hindu people are also there, Buddhist people are there, but without any fighting, without they peacefully coexist over there. That is the main thing. And uh, lots of shrines are over there. In each and every uh, street that lane that you pass by, you'll find lots and lots of um, uh, small small temples over there, and they will be adorned with uh, all beautiful flowers over there. So even the narrowest and the busiest streets, yes, they will be filled with adorned deities, uh, that is gods and goddesses. Then there will be fruit sellers, there will be flute sellers also, hawkers uh, selling postcards, shops selling western cosmetics for people who come from abroad. Then film rolls, because in those days, uh, the digital cameras were not there. Yes, cameras having film rolls were there, uh, negatives, right? So. Uh, even the smallest of the shop will be having a uh, few uh, camera rolls over there of different varieties so that the tourists who come over there uh, when their film gets over, roll gets over, they need to buy another one, right? So film rolls are there, chocolates, variety of chocolates are available, copper utensils because uh, Kathmandu is the capital of Nepal and people from various small and big towns and villages and cities, even um, uh, from far away mountains, high, living high up, they come to Kathmandu to buy their daily needs. So you'll find lots of copper utensils, Nepalese antiques you'll find over there, film songs blaring. Now film songs will be, of course, Indian, but then uh, music has also developed in uh, Nepal and uh, the Nepalese songs also will be broadcasted over there and they will be played over there. But usually, mostly, you'll find Indian songs, film songs blaring out of there from the radios. Car horns, lots of traffic is there, so car horns will sound. Cycle bells, because many of them are quite poor, and there will be lots of pedestrians and lots of cyclists over there. So, cycle bells ringing, stray cows, just like in India. Yes, uh, Nepal is an adjoining country, no different from, the society is no different from India, so you'll have lots of stray cows, stray dogs, etc. And on top of that, because it is one of the uh, secluded area, uh, just below the mountain, so you'll find lots of monkeys over also there. Low questioningly at uh, uh, cows, stray cows, low questioningly at the motorcycles. Yes, we uh, understand that cows, their impediments in the um, uh, traffic, yes, they, they just stand over there and the motorcycle will keep on honking his horn. And when, the, when he honks the horn, yes, it sounds like that uh, mowing of the cow, the sound of the cow. The cow will look at the motorcyclist and give a low moan. Right, so that way it looks quite uh, funny. Yes, the uh, motorcycle um, person, he is trying to get rid of the cow in, who is in the front of the vehicle. But the cow is just adamant, modern, doesn't want to move from there and gives a uh, low mow uh, to the motorcycle that you go around wherever it's possible. And of course, the uh, vendors, they are selling out their wares, shouting their wares out so that people will get attracted and come over there. 
I introduce myself mindless. You know, he's a tourist over there. Yes, nobody knows him by face. Yes, oh, of course, all the literary people, all the learned people might know him by face. But then he's an unknown face in the crowd, right? So, and he, uh, we know that he's staying at a very cheap hotel, right? And he is just uh, roaming around the streets of Kathmandu. So, I indulge myself mindlessly. Indulge, involve myself mindlessly. He does not have a fixed target. He has vis visited the Pashupatina temple and he has visited the Bhavna Stupa. After that, he doesn't have anything more to see. So he just mindlessly, he just roaming around in the marketplace, yes, and turning any street corners, going, to, going into any street, yes, without any thought, just looking around and watching. Buy a bar of marzipan. That marzipan is uh, uh, is a sweet, country-made sweet, yes, so a bar of marzipan, corn on the cob roasted in charcoal brazier on the pavement, nothing else, uh, right, so uh, when that corn is uh, heated up on the brazier, brazier means that uh, sigri, right, so uh, on the sigri we know the coal is there, uh, that uh, charcoal is there and on which the maize is kept and it is turned rotated uh, so that uh, it's well roasted and then uh, salt, uh, mit, uh, chili and uh, lemon, yes, uh, it's uh, that uh, rubbed with salt, chili and powder and lemon, uh, chili powder and lemon and then we, uh, then that is given on the, uh, on the uh, cob, right, the cob is uh, corn on the cob. So cob is just that layer we take out um, for exposing the uh, corn. So a couple of love story comics and even a reader digest. Reader's digest is also fun. And he's just loitering around over there, uh, funny trying to observe and he's just watching everywhere. And to pass the time he takes a bar of um, uh, marzipan and uh, corn on, uh, on the cob and he's just eating it and uh, loitering around. And he sees a vendor trying to sell some uh, old newspaper and even a reader digest is found over there. Uh, so he is just, you know, the tourist come and sell those things and he has just uh, displayed it that somebody might come and buy it. As I wash down with Coca-Cola and a nauseating orange drink uh, and feel much better for it. Now, uh, he is eating that uh, marzipan also at the same time, he is eating cob, uh, all, uh, corn also. and. Uh, he washes down. Meaning of washes down is, uh, suppose uh, we are having lunch, then we wash down the food with dal. Same way when we are having pizza, we wash down the food with the help of uh, soft drinks. So same way here is having a soft drink, Coca-Cola, and a local orange, nauseating, nauseating, you know, not good smell coming out of it, right? But then feel much better because you know, there is lots of heat over there and uh, he uh, feels cool by having a Coca-Cola and the uh, orange, a local orange drink. I consider what route I should take back home if I was propelled by enthusiasm for travel per se. Now, uh, he has reached Nepal and now he wants to come to India. Yes, now he's deciding upon which route to take from uh, Kathmandu to Now we should remember that he is traveling right from China. He has uh, taken all of the route by road, by air. We are not told that in this particular extract, but he is traveling from China. He had come to Tibet. He had spent a few days over there in Tibet. Then he came down to Nepal. So he's already thoroughly tired coming to Kathmandu. So now he is thinking of how to take his journey from Kathmandu to uh, his place, that is Delhi, right? So he's just thinking more upon it. Now, we have a sentence over here. If I were propelled by enthusiasm, propelled, pushed. Yes, here it means pushed. He still wants an exciting journey from Kathmandu to Delhi. Right? So if I was propelled by enthusiasm, enthusiasm trying to do something good. Right? In the same way. The same way that he has traveled from China to Tibet, Tibet to Nepal. If that enthusiasm is that strong move, motive continues, then what route he should take? Or if he is very tired, what route he is going to take? Per se. Per se means just for uh, sake of uh, that enthusiasm. 
I would go by bus and train to Patna and then sail up the Ganges past Banaras to Allahabad and then up to Yamuna past Agra to Delhi. Now, this is one way he's thinking. So he will take a bus from Kathmandu, he will come to uh, uh, Patna, uh, he will come by bus, he'll come to Siliguri. Siliguri to Patna, he'll take the train. So from uh, the uh, Kathmandu, from Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, he will come by bus to, uh, because there is no railroad over there. So he'll have to come to West Bengal, that is uh, Siliguri, right? And from Siliguri, he will take a train to Patna. Now, Patna is where Ganges flows. So from Patna, he will go in the opposite flow towards Allahabad. Allahabad is where Ganga, Yamuna and Saraswati meet. So till Allahabad, he will travel by boat from Patna to Allahabad because Ganges and we know uh, it is a national waterway number one, right? So up till Allahabad, he can travel very safely in the boat. Now, uh, when he comes to Allahabad, one that is Ganges and another is Yamuna, both of that is a confluence over there, meeting point of river Ganga and uh, river Ram Yamuna and Saraswati comes out from under the ground. It is a belief, right? That that is go easily Tribeni Sangam Bolte Allahabad ko, where there is a confluence of Gang the Ganges, Yamuna, and Ganga, Yamuna, or Saraswati. So when he comes to Allahabad, he will change the river from Ganga. He will take the boat from uh, Yamuna from Allahabad, and he will travel all the way to. Uh, um, Benares, Ganges past Benares to Allahabad and then up to Yamuna. Then up to Allahabad, he will travel by uh, a boat to uh, Allahabad and then from Allahabad, he will go to Agra by uh, traveling in Yamuna River. And we know Yamuna flows near Agra, same thing Yamuna flows to Delhi also, near Delhi also. So that is one way of going from uh, uh, Kathmandu to Delhi but we think that the author is so much tired of the journey it has been quite a long journey he's quite exhausted and he just wants to be at home very soon but I'm too exhausted and he's also homesick because homesick means you are away from home for quite a long time then you feel uh, that you should once visit your home you know, so you feel you are worried about your family you want to see your family members or you just want to be in the hometown at home that's called homesickness. Today is the last day of August. Yes, that means 31st of August. Go home, I tell myself. Move directly towards home. Yes, don't go again through that excruciating uh, journey by bus to Siliguri, then from Siliguri to train by to Patna, then from Patna catch a boat and come to Benares um, and uh, what say Allahabad from Allahabad again you change the river and up to Lagra and then to Delhi you again take a boat so it's quite a lengthy journey it's going to take a lot of time he's already exhausted so I tell myself just go home so he I enter a Nepal Airlines office and buy a ticket for tomorrow's flight directly to Delhi yes we have because Kathmandu is the capital of Nepal and Delhi is the capital of India. So we have international airlines that, that takes us from one capital to another. So he takes the uh, ticket of uh, Nepal Airways and uh, buys the ticket directly to Delhi. I look at the, now he, is, now he has bought the ticket for tomorrow's flight. So he still has half a day with him. So he's just standing over there and he sees, uh, I look at the food seller standing in a corner of the square near the hotel. Near the hotel, he sees there is a square. Square means Ocho Rasta Chokri Opia, right? So he sees, uh, we see it all the time that fruits, uh, fruit sellers, yes, they stand somewhere near the end of the market, near a Chokri, where lots of people come and go. So, and he keeps on playing his flute. Mostly uh, adults won't be attracted towards him. Usually the children are attracted and they see him playing that flute. So, uh, so, magically that they will think that uh, small children they think that they will uh, buy the flute and they will also uh, move their fingers on the holes and they will be playing the same melodious tune but it doesn't happen like that because of course they don't have the training but children they get attracted towards that melodious tune that comes out it's quite sharp shrill because these are homemade uh, flutes yes you must have seen on a big bamboo like some spokes like a small small bamboo uh, sticks come out and he has 
kept those uh, flutes over there in the sticks, hanging in the sticks, right? And one of the children, where, uh, when he, while he is playing the flute, lots of children pass by and they uh, uh, create a mess over there. Yes, they want to buy the flute and the mother or father, whoever is with them, at last, because the child is crying, so uh, it doesn't cost that much, five, ten rupees. Yes, so the parents buy them a flute. They know uh, he's not going to be able to play it, but then it will at least make him stop cry, and that is exactly what the flute seller wants. He wants to sell his wares. So how do you sell it? By propagating it, right? Propagate it. So uh, he's standing there in the corner of the uh, s square near the hotel. In his hand is a pole with an attachment of trough, uh, 50 or 60 basuris. Basuri, we say, uh, protrude in all direction like quills of a porcupine. Porcupine is a small animal with lots of quills. Yes, they're quite, uh, they sting and there's a little bit poison over there. Even the tigers and the lions, yes, uh, they don't dare to go near the porcupine. They won't eat, to eat it, but then at that time when the porcupine sees danger, it will uh, swell its uh, quills and that will give a real beautiful sting in the mouth of the uh, predator and the predator is going to run away because of that sting, yes. So uh, it's just the same scene that the bamboo is there with lots of quills and on um, each and every quill he has hang a flute. From time to time he stands the pole on the ground, selects a flute and plays for a few minutes. So he keeps on changing his flute now and then, yes, he's been playing with one flute here. Uh, time to time he'll put the bamboo down, he'll put it back and take another flute and play with it. The sound rises clearly above the noise of the traffic. As I said, the sound of the flute, it's, it's very, very uh, sharp and shrill, so it will be heard very easily above the sound of the traffic, above all the human uh, beings over there making the uh, lots of noise in the market, but the sound of the flute will be heard above them. And the hawkers are also crying. You can clearly uh, find that sweet melody is coming to your ears direct, even when there's lots of crowd, where there's lots of noise in the market. He plays slowly, meditatively. Yes, he, he always picks a very fine tune, yes, which is quite melodious and known to everybody. So everybody just loves to listen to it without excessive display. He does not shout out his words because he is already displaying his art of uh, playing the flute very well, and he doesn't need to shout uh, to the passerby to buy a flute for him, from him, because by playing it, he uh, displays his uh, wares, he displays his art, and people are going to stop over there and buy a basuri from him. Occasionally, he makes a sell, but in con curiously offhanded way, as if there were an incident to his enterprise. Now and then somebody might come and buy a flute from him. He doesn't pay much attention as if it's a regular thing. Of course, he has been doing this for quite a lot of years and is accustomed to this. It is his daily bread and butter. But he doesn't give so much emphasis. He doesn't talk with the customer. His customer will say, this one, no, this one, no, this one, no, this one. So he will show four or five flutes and out of that the customer is going to select one and give him the money, hand over the money. Because it's cheap, nobody bargains with him. That's the main thing. Yes, it's so cheap that people kidnap five rupees. Oh, okay, that's okay. Don't give, uh, give me for six rupees, five rupees, eight rupees. Nobody is going to bargain because it is already so cheap. So, he does his business in an off-handed way, not really mu uh, worrying much about the sales because he knows at the end of the day he's going to sell some 10-15 uh, basuris and that's enough for his livelihood. Sometimes he breaks off pl um, playing to talk to the fruit seller. I imagine that this has been the pattern for his life for years. We know he has been standing over there for quite a lot of number of years and the fruit seller is also there. So time to time he stops playing flute when he gets tired of it and uh, there's a little bit talking with the nearest friend and that might be the fruit seller. Both of them talk and by looking at what he is doing, the author observes that for quite a lot of number of years he might be standing over there and he might be doing the same thing, selling his flutes on a day-to-day -day basis. I find it difficult to tear myself away from the square. Flute music always does this too me. 
Now, is, uh, as we discussed earlier also, that uh, these flute wallahs, they pick up very melodious song. Yes, uh, might be an old song, but it will be so melodious that people will stop to hear it, or people who are nearby, they'll just keep on listening to that music. So, it becomes very difficult for the author to break away from that scene, because flute music, it always does this type of magic to him. It is, uh, it is at once the most universal and most particular of science. Now this paragraph is quite important. All the generations, all the civilizations, they had their own flutes. Because flute is nothing. We have learned that in uh, chapter number two, uh, uh, where the fungi is uh, transformed into a shehnai and uh, Ustadji, he plays that uh, Shehnai. Basically, it's a reed instrument. Reed, it is found near each and every river bank, lakes, freshwater, right? Reeds are hollow tubings. So anybody can find a hollow tubing, uh, punch some holes in it, and start playing Basuri by uh, uh, fixing one end and leaving the other end open. and. Uh, pumping air into it with the help of uh, the uh, mouth and um, blocking the holes, we get beautiful music. So each and every generation, each and every civilization, they have their own flutes. Maybe the variety is different, the type is different, but at the end it is just a hollow reed. So it is at once the most universal because everybody has been using it in all the generation and all the civilization. And the most particular of sound, yes, this is a very natural instrument uh, because it's uh, made from wood. So it is. it will be giving that natural sound which no other musical instrument will be able to give. So it's very particular. There is no culture that does not have its flute. There is no culture. There is, uh, there is no culture. There is no civilization. There is no generation which has not been uh, making flutes and making a variety of flutes uh, and enjoying the music. The reed name, now some names are given. Reed, we talked about it. Whole of this is nothing but a uh, hollow empty reed. Yes, a tubing. So the reed name, that is the name of the instrument, the recorder, the Japanese uh, shakuhachi, the deep bansuri of Hindustani classical music, the clear and the breathy flutes of South America, that is Brazil, etc. Right? So all of them, they are reed instruments. They might be the hollow tubing is bigger or smaller, or it's broader, or it's longer. So the tonal quality of the music may change, but the quality remains the same because it comes out from the wood. It comes out from the depth of the heart because you have to blow it with your air from the lungs. Yes, and the music is generated by the uh, musician. No, the music is generated by the person who is um, blowing it. Mostly in the olden days, we find the shepherds. Yes, they just find a flute and start playing, right? They have their own tunes. They did not get any particular uh, training for the uh, playing the flute, but they just take out melodies of their own. So this is a very natural musical instrument, and each and every generation, each and every culture, each and every civilization, they had their own kinds of flute, and people have been playing it since ages. The high-pitched Chinese flutes, each has its specific fingering and compass. Yes, the way we play it. Fingering, the way we block and open the holes when we blow the air into it. It wields its own association. Yet, to hear any flute is, it seems to me, to be drawn into communality of all mankind. Because it is universal, it is played everywhere. Each and every country has its own reed instrument. Each and every generation, each and every civilization, each and every country, they have their own musical instrument, especially the flute. So it is a universal kind of thing. And to hear the flute is like drawn into that particular community of all mankind. To be moved by music, closest in its phrases and sentence to the human voice. Yes, when we speak, we blow out air actually. Now that same air, instead of words, is going into the flute, so you can actually hear some words, because uh, what the flute player is playing will be a popular sound, will be a popular song, or maybe a popular tune. So people, when he's playing it, people will sing along with it, karaoke, right? So in that way, uh, it seems as if the flute um, player is giving out words with the help of flute. 
the motive force is living breath what's the most how, how does the flute make sound it is that that motive force is the uh, live breath that is put into the flute it too needs to pause and breath before it can go on just like we need to inhale and exhale same way we stop while speaking we uh, stop to inhale while speaking we stop to exhale so same thing when you are playing a flute you need to exhale exhale is already there we you need to inhale also so that small small stoppage pauses in between the music adds beauty to the music that i can be so affected by few familiar phrases on the basuri surprises me and first because it's a popular song for on previous occasions that i have written home after a long absence abroad i have hardly noticed such details i certainly have not invested them with the significance i now do because he has a leisure time yes he knows he has got a flight tomorrow morning this is the half a day that he has left with him and he doesn't have any specific to do so up till now he was always in a hurry from one place to another this is the small little time that he is having so he is pondering over those small small details observations that he is making and he is surprised to find that they are quite obsess and that's quite uh, interesting yes to miss out these small small details earlier he never count on that because he had little time for these observation but today he finds that after staying away from home quite quite a lot of time when you are in a hurry to get back home it's quite difficult to stay focused on these small small observation but this time of course it might be different it might be because of the flute that is being played over there by that hawker <coughs> but he had yet not invested uh, with them the significance that i now do he really should keep on observing such small details which uh, is not only a very good experience but collection of such observations he can always put it into his novels and make his writing more and more beautiful uh, students with this we come to the end of this chapter thank you students now students let us do some textual grammar that is given at the end of the chapter chapter number 10 Kathmandu thinking about the language read the following sentences carefully in the sentences that are given to understand the meaning of the bold phrases then match the phrasal verbs in column a with the meanings in column b now we are talking about phrasal verbs now what are phrasal verbs phrasal verbs are two separate words one is the verb uh, added with a preposition right so a preposition is added to a verb and both of them together is called a phrasal verb yes so we are given over here some sentences from where we have to pick out those phrasal verbs that is the first thing and try, then try to uh, make out the meaning of that phrasal verb so now as we know phrasal verbs are made up of two things first it's a verb and then it's a preposition so two words together make up a totally different meaning because verb it will have one meaning preposition it will have one meaning but when we combine both of them together it gives a third meaning so that is called a phrasal verb yes it's a it's a phrase right uh, because two words are there a small phrase is there plus the main work is of the uh, verb so it's called a phrasal verb now a communal war broke out when princess was abducted by the neighboring prince so here we see let us try to find out what is the uh, phrasal verb a uh, article uh, communal war war is noun so communal becomes adjective broke out broke is a verb out is a preposition right so this can be broke out can be a phrasal verb when the princess princess again now was abducted verb but then we don't have any preposition by we have was abducted by but then was abducted by so really the neighboring princess so we have over here this is the phrasal verb break out now what is the meaning of breakout start of something the war started because 
the neighboring prince, he abducted the princess of this kingdom and ran away a lot with the princess. So, break out. Break out, start off something. It can be war, it can be disease. For example, this pandemic that we are having, it's a breakout. Right? The pandemic broke out. That is what we say. Broke out, it suddenly started and started spreading. Right? Because it is pandemic, it happens that way. Yes, breakout means all of a sudden start and then start spreading. Here, communal war started. So, communal war started, broke out. So, broke out meaning is start usually of something that may be a disease, maybe a pandemic, maybe war. So, this is the meaning that we get from this particular phrasal verb. So, please remember what is the meaning? Broke out, start of something. The cockpit broke off from the plane during the plane crash. Now, when the plane crashed, the cockpit and the rest of the pack. Cockpit is where the pilots, they seat, right? So, that thing got separated because of force, because of the impact of the plane crash. The car broke down on the way and we were left stranded in the jungle. So the car stopped functioning due to n number of reasons. Either the tires were flat or usually broke down. Something wrong happened and the car function stopped. Yes, the car couldn't move, just, just did not move. So usually it is with the engine and when especially the driver doesn't have that many tools or he is not aware of the repairing of the work. So it might be a very small uh, fault, but then he is not able to uh, actually pick up that and then thing. So broke down, that means stop functioning. The decoy broke broke away from the police. Now everywhere we have the same thing. We have the verb as broke, but the preposition keeps on changing, right? So the same word, yes, the preposition changes. We have a totally different meaning. Same way, broke is there. Broke is there. Preposition changed again down. Yes, same way. Broke is the same word verb, but away is the preposition down. The bro brothers broke his safe. Again, we have preposition which is different. So, in that way, you will have that same word, but then you can have lots and lots of prepositions to go with that word, verb. And that makes the meaning, total meaning of the uh, phrasal verb different. For example, here broke off means got, got separated by force. Here broke down means stop functioning. Here, the decoy broke away. He was with the police and he was able to escape. So here it is broke away means escape. The brothers broke up. Broke up, father died. So brothers, they couldn't stay together. Now they got separated. So here it broke up is now they separated. Yes, they are brothers, but they separated. They don't live together. That is the meaning. Here broke off, broke up, broke down, broke away. So we see the uh, word remains the same. That is broke. Whereas the preposition keeps on changing and entirely new meaning is detected out of it, right? So the cockpit broke off, it got separated with force, the car broke down. That means it gone, uh, they stopped functioning. The decoy broke away from the police as they took him to the court. As they were taking him to the court, the decoy found a chance and maybe pushed the policeman and just jumped the wall and ran away. So broke away, escaped. The brothers broke up after the death of the father. No, father is dead. Father is what made them live together. Yes, father is father after all and he doesn't want his children to live separately. He wants to see all of them right in front of him. But as soon as the father died, they both broke up. That means they both separated. Last sentence is the thief broke into. Broke into means now the thief Yes, he is not a welcome person. You didn't invite him. You didn't send an invitation card to him. He is entering by force and that also illegal. Yes, so this is illegal entry. The thief illegally entered our house when we were away. Of course, whenever you are out of your house, nobody should enter your house. Yes, and that also without asking you, right? So, uh, thief, I don't think they come to ask an amber for an appointment and set the time and then come on time. So, this is a legal entry that the thieves have done, broke into. It means illegal entry or enter without any proper 
permission. Now let us join the columns A with B. Now we already know the meaning. What is the meaning of breakout? To come apart due to force, end relationship, break and enter, nickel, to start suddenly. So A goes with D of start something. Usually a fight, a war or a disease that is called a breakout. Break off. To come apart due to force, to end a relationship, break and enter relationship, to escape, to stop working. So this will be A, broke off. Broke down. Break down. Break down means to stop working, right? My car broke down, so stop working. So this is F. Break away to escape from someone's grip. So break away is E. Break up. Break up means relationship. That is to end the relationship. Break up. And break into is break and enter illegally. So that is C. Right? So phrasal verb and the meaning. The verb remains the same. Break, 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 break. But the prepositions keep on changing. Out, off, down, away, uh, up, into. So as, we, as soon as we change the preposition, we have a totally new meaning out of the combined word. That's called a phrasal verb. 